All right, if you have a Bible or a, a phone with a Bible app, uh, go ahead and turn over to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. Probably going to shake a little bit. Might pause. Just ask you hang on with me if that occurs. Again, John chapter 11. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting. I was telling Nikki before I came in here that uh, I learned a lot about my dad since I came back up this final time. Um, and the things that people tell you, it's just very interesting how God chooses to use them. One of my uh, good friends growing up, Micaiah, um, was telling me something. Uh, I don't have kids. I act like a kid all the time. Uh, so he felt it was good to tell me something from a kid movie and it hit home. Uh, he was talking about the good dinosaur and how there's one scene where the father tells his son, you're me and more. And then the other night in all this, we decided it'd be a good idea to go do something um, fun. So we went to go see Mary Poppins Returns. And there was a scene in that movie where, for those of you who haven't seen it, minor spoiler alert, just minor spoiler alert, I'm sorry. Um, Michael Banks' uh, wife has died, and she, he has three kids, and he tells them, your mother's not really gone, is she? She's in your walk and in your eyes and in your smile. And when I saw my father last night for the first time in a long time, I walked up and the first thing that just stuck out in my mind was, wow, he really looks like his dad. I've never seen him quite look so much like my grandpa church. And as we go into the scriptures, I just want you to bear that in the back of your mind that who my dad is did not end when he left this earth, that we are him and more. So if you're in John chapter 11, we will be going through a lengthy part of the passage, but we're just going to start in verse 17 and read a, a short amount. For those of you who don't know what's going on, uh, Lazarus, one of Jesus' friends here on this earth, has died. His sister sent for Jesus to come, and Jesus didn't come at first. He waited a few days, and then he traveled. And we're going to pick it up in verse 17, where the Bible says, Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh to Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off, and many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she had heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. And then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, shall, uh, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Jesus saith, uh, she saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep. Then, Mary, uh, then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have ye laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Let's open up this portion of the service in a word of prayer. Father, as we approach your word this morning at a time, which for many people in this room is very hard, I ask that your Holy Spirit would fill me and overflow me, that your message would come forth with great power. And I know without a doubt that this is the message that you had planned for this moment. 
So, Father, fortify me, give me stamina, that it would indeed land as intended. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, uh, I have many interesting different memories of my father. And it's interesting that when you talk to anybody about my dad, it seems like the number one word that comes up is faithful. He was faithful in everything that he did. And that's what I remember of him. I mean, I remember the one or two times he made it to a high school basketball game. And I was not one of these kids who lamented that my dad almost never made it to a basketball game. Why? Because I knew why dad couldn't make it to a basketball game. Dad was busy working to make sure that we would have everything we need. I was an only child, man. I don't know if y'all, y'all think it may be cheaper to have an only child, but you don't get it. You got to buy me more Christmas presents. It's the same as if you had seven. Am I right, brother? It's the same amount of work. And uh, I mean, my parents had me and they just stopped. They went, nope, that's, that's enough. I'm done. My dad was out busy preparing and, and, and uh, doing what he needed to do and, and providing so that my mom would have what she needed even beyond when he died. Um, I remember very specifically my dad teaching and my aunt teaching me how to ride a bike. I remember because I remember, I think it happened faster than any of us thought. My dad had attempted to teach me how to ride a bike before, um, and he had done his best, but I was impatient. It, it, it runs in the family, <laughs> and he needed some backup. And so Aunt Sharon uh, came and helped. And I can actually vividly remember uh, her pushing me, and then the moment I took off, and she was kind of scrambling to not fall down after I made it. And that look on my dad's face when I came around, and then we went home and we showed grandma and grandpa and mom that I could ride the bike. I remember that. But you know, there are two memories that stand out in my mind more than anything about my father. The first memory that really stands out in my mind is uh, when I walked into his room wearing this uniform. Now, for those of you who don't know what this is, this is not an active duty military uniform. I'm a civilian volunteer in the United States Service Command, but to dad, that didn't matter. As far as dad was concerned, I was a Navy chaplain. And you should have seen the pride in his eyes and the joy because he wasn't content with just his life. His mission was always bigger than him. But he took the time to share it with me. The other memory that really stands out in my mind is when he went to get his little Nissan XE green pickup truck. He had had this uh, GMC, which had been the bane of his existence since he got it. He hated that thing. It was a new truck, but it was always at the repair shop. And uh, we knew he was going to get a truck. And so off he went to buy this truck. And finally, he, he comes home. And uh, I, I, it had to be in the summer because I was home and mom wasn't. So I think mom was off working at, at, at uh, day camp or something and uh I, I said dad how'd you get get here he goes i drove yeah, duh i know you drove i'm like how'd you get here and he said well come and see so we went outside and there in the the driveway is this green pickup truck and my dad said these words to me you want to go for a ride yes we jumped in the pickup truck and as my aunt Sharon alluded to, my dad had this thing about just taking off into the mountains and into the wilderness. And he was going to take me with him for a little bit. And we drove up into the mountains. We went to Shaver Lake. We went to a dam. We drove up to this ranger station at 10,000 feet elevation. And my dad spent the day with me. And that trip in my mind is one of the strongest memories that I have of him. It was very special. Simply put... Today, we're going to be looking at three memorials from this passage of Scripture. See, the, the title of the message has come forth when Jesus attended a funeral. And God has a purpose in funerals. The important thing is that we don't miss it. We don't miss that message. And the first of those three memorials we see is tremendous love. Tremendous love. And, and, and we see that in verses 1 through 5 where we see, first of all, a horrible sickness. In verse 1, it says, Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. Lazarus was sick. And the truth is that we all will deal with sickness and pain in our lives, and Lazarus was no different. Whether we know the Savior or not makes no difference in that. And a lot of people misunderstand, and they think that just because uh, they became a Christian, all their problems are just going to stop. That's not how it works. There was a, a horrible sickness. But we also see that there was a history of service in verse 2. Bible says it was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. See, if you know the rest of the Bible, you would know that there was a time when a woman who was a woman of the streets, 
a harlot, a prostitute, in her repentance came to Jesus Christ and broke open a very precious ointment box and wiped Jesus' feet with it with the ointment and the tears in her hair. And that person was Mary. And that's just like Jesus. That, that it didn't matter. Jesus didn't really have a, too much of a thing for hobnobbing with the rich. Oh, there were a few that, that kept company with him. You know. um, but it didn't matter to Jesus. He, he, even though he was better than anybody, he didn't act like it. It did not matter to him that she was a prostitute. And everyone else in the house was offended. But for her, she found in Jesus a savior. So there was a history of service. And then we see what's very interesting under this tremendous love is a horrendous supposition. Verses 3 through 5, the Bible says, Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, That sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. You say, what's this horrid supposition? Well, when we read in English, we don't really see this. But there's more than one Greek word for love, and they mean very different things. Now, when they said in verse 3, Lazarus, whom thou lovest, is sick, they use the Greek word phileo. Now, we get our English word philanthropy from that. And so, literally, they were putting Jesus' love for Lazarus on the same level that you might have for a charity event. Uh, you know, you feel bad because you see some people who, uh, you know, I, I, uh, one of the charities I work with is Warrior Foundation Freedom Station. And they help um, active duty military who are transitioning to uh, civilian life who have been medically discharged with that. And, you know, we look at that and say, I want to volunteer my time. And that's the kind of love we have for them. It's a philanthropic love. That's not the kind of love that Jesus had for Lazarus, though. See, in verse 5, when it says, now Jesus loved Martha and his sister and Lazarus, that's the other word. Agapao, agape. And agape has the idea of a love that will go to death. It actually comes from a Hebrew word called agab. And agab means to breathe after, to dote a lover. He loved Lazarus the exact same way that one of us would love our children and dote on them, or we would love our spouse. And think about what you wouldn't do for those people in your life who you love so desperately. That's the kind of love that Jesus had for him. So we see, first of all, the first of the three memorials is a tremendous love. The second, though, is a terrible loss, a terrible loss. And under that, we see the waiting, first of all, in verse six. It says, when he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. And you know what? We'll see this a little bit later on. But Mary and Martha couldn't understand why that happened. They could not understand why, why the disciples were with him. Why? You just heard that he's sick. And, you know, I, I was always for about a year and a half waiting. Am I going to get the call saying you need to come to Fresno now? Now I didn't get the chance. I didn't get the call saying come now. But, you know, when you get the come now call, you come right now. Jesus got the come now call and stayed put for two days. He waited and everyone else had to wait on him, too. And it may seem a little unfair, but we're going to get to some of why that was later. We also see the walking, the walking, verses 7 through 13. And then after that, saith he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples say to him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. When we wait for Jesus and he finally starts to walk with us, he'll teach us if we're willing to listen. And in these times when we don't understand, it's really important, even more so than ever, to listen to the voice of God. Speaking in our ears, watching what he does, listening to him instruct us. And if you think about this in a very literal sense, the disciples weren't waiting with Martha and Mary for Jesus to show up. They were waiting with him. You know, the people who are in heaven right now waiting for Jesus to come back, they're waiting too. 
The Bible tells us that they don't know when Jesus is coming back, and they want him to come back too. They want him to come back and end all of this pain and this suffering that we deal with. But they're waiting too. So we see that there was waiting, and there was walking, and then there was a waking of hope. In verse 14, the Bible says, uh, sorry, let's go ahead and pick it up in verse, yeah, 14 is fine. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent. You may believe that nevertheless, let us go unto him. So they start walking, and we see a questioning of his motives. In verse 20, Martha finds out that Jesus is there, and then Martha, as soon as she had heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother hath not died. Um, you know, it's interesting to me, Mary stayed put and Martha ran. Different people grieve in different ways. Some people have to stay active. Some people are just going to sit there and process. But Martha ran. And I think it's really important to note this. And a lot of Christians miss this because I just, I don't know, maybe it's our culture. Maybe it's what we've heard. God never rebuked a single person who came to him with a complaint. Not one time. And he didn't do it to Martha. And he didn't do it to Mary a few verses later. She came and she questioned him. Why did you do that? If you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And then we see the quiet belief. Verses 22 through 27. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. See, what we believe is taught by the Bible is very different from anything else that had come before it. It was part of why the, the, the Greeks in Athens found it so strange. Almost every religion had taught an afterlife. Jesus wasn't teaching just an afterlife. He was talking about a spiritual resurrection to a physical body. That one day things would change and that the grave is not the end for a Christian. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. We have a body now that is corruptible, that is plagued by sin and by pain and by, by suffering. And, it, and it's important to understand that that's the whole reason that Jesus came in the first place. And we understand that this isn't the end. And just that little bit of hope, she held on to that. Now, the simple fact of the matter is that just because we know that there's going to be a resurrection doesn't make it any easier on those of us who are still here. It doesn't. You know, people say, I feel like a bad Christian because I know he's in a better place, but uh, it's okay to weep and cry. You know, uh, when I was in college and I would have to leave my parents after a vacation, I would often weep because I knew I was going to miss them. Like, yeah, of course I was going to see them again, but leaving them is what hurt. And then later on, when I was dating Nikki, there were times when I'd be driving away from seeing her at college and I'd just pull off after about a mile into the desert and cry for 20 minutes because I, I, I was going to miss her. It didn't matter that I'd see her again in three days or, or, or a week. I had to leave. And for them, they had to watch me go. Do not ever apologize when you feel pain and sorrow at the loss of a loved one just because you know you're going to see him again. It's natural. And that's why we not only see the walking and the waiting and the waking of hope, but we see the weeping. We see the weeping. Who weeped? Well, in verse 32 and 33a, we see that his sisters wept. The Bible says that when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother hath not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, she was weeping. Family has the right to weep. Then we see that the sympathetic also wept, continuing, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her. We all have the right to weep, not just family. It's okay. Not one time do you find Jesus rebuking any of these people saying, hey, don't you remember? I'm coming back someday. Why are you crying? Because it's okay. Because it's normal. 
But probably what is even more powerful than that is not only that we see that the sister and the sympathetic wept, but we see that the Savior wept. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled and said, where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible, but perhaps the most profound. Why would Jesus weep knowing everything he did with the unlimited power he had? Because first of all, he experienced their pain firsthand. He experienced their pain firsthand. You gotta remember something, there is no time to God. We all have a past and a present and a future. Presently we're here in the past, my father was alive and in the future I'll see him again someday, but not now. To God, there is no past, there is no future. He is eternal present tense. He told the people who asked him before Abraham was, I am. Everything is now to God. And he, even though on his earth had not yet experienced the cross, we understand that he already had experienced the cross because there was no time to him. And Jesus did not just die on the cross for our sins specifically to take us to heaven. He experienced every single consequence that sin brings. Every single last one of them. You know what the Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah chapter 53 verse 4? Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. That means every single pain and every single sorrow that we have ever felt and the pain he took on him and experienced firsthand how you feel right now, Jesus felt. And it caused him to weep. Moreover, he wept because he loved him so much. In verse 36, then said the Jews, behold how he loved him. And they used that word phileo again. They still didn't get it. Man, he loved him. He loved him more than even his family loved him. He, he loved my dad more than we loved him. And that's something that's difficult to grasp because I love my dad a whole lot. And I think when I read this passage, and I just really found this, that he wept because he had to let Lazarus die in this instance. Verse 37 and some of them said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? See, the Bible makes plain throughout this passage of scripture. Jesus said that he didn't come for the intent that the disciples should believe. Why? Because if he had come, he still would have had to have let Lazarus die. That's why he waited. He needed Lazarus to die before he got there. That's why when Martha and Mary said, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. That's why these people said, if this guy had been here, wouldn't... Couldn't Lazarus have not died? Yes, yes, that's correct. If Jesus had come, he could have kept him from dying, but he had to let him die. There was a purpose in letting him die. And I really think it hurt Jesus personally that he had to let that happen because he loved him and he knew the pain and the sorrow that it was going to cause. Jesus is not this ethereal, Surreal, excuse me, the surreal entity that doesn't get us. He was among us, experiencing everything that we experienced. He experienced fatigue and hunger and thirst, and he experienced our sorrows. And it asks, leads people to ask, why would a God of love allow such suffering? Why would God let his friend be sick and die if he loved him so much? The answer is actually quite simple. Love. You see, wait a minute, that don't make any sense. Well, it does when you understand love. We don't often understand love in this world. We seem to think love is an emotion. We confuse love with infatuation. When I was dating Nikki, I was infatuated with her. I love her. There is a difference between being in love with someone and loving someone. See, love is a decision to show grace toward another person regardless of what they do. My wife, has, my wife has lots of love toward me because I mess up a lot. Just ask her. She'll tell you. Well, maybe not. She's a very merciful wife. Um, God allows us to make our own decisions. And understand that we were slain with a sickness in our lives called sin as well. And the Bible tells us that sin always has the same result. Death. 
For the wages of sin is death. The Bible tells us that lust, when it is conceived, bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The ultimate result of sin is death. Every single bit of pain and suffering and sorrow and anguish we have is a result of sin in our lives. And God lets us choose if we will follow the path of sin or follow him. He lets us make that decision and he lets us live with the consequences of our decision. Because really, would we have a free choice to love him, to accept his free gift of salvation if we couldn't choose, if we had to? That's not love, that's compulsion. Jesus lets us live with these decisions in our lives. Because of that, we don't only see a tremendous love and a terrible loss, but third and finally, we see a triumphant loosing. A triumphant loosing. In the next verses, we're going to see three commands that Jesus gives to remove barriers. Starting in verse 38. Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone laid upon it. Jesus, saying, uh, Jesus said, take ye away the stone. Take away the stone. Why? Because there was something that was keeping Lazarus from his Savior. There was something keeping him between Lazarus and his Savior. See, Jesus once died on a cross and there was another stone that kept the world from its Savior too. And that stone was rolled away after Jesus had been dead for three days. And the world was reunited with the possibility of salvation. And this man, Lazarus, as he laid in his grave, had a stone between him and, him and his Savior. And God said, take it away. Take it away. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou heardst me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. Jesus was always thinking of other people. We see that there was a command to remove a barrier between Lazarus and his Lord. Then there was a command to remove a barrier between Lazarus and life. Verse 43, And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. God said, come into my life, take me. The Bible said, for he hath made sin to be, for him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Everything that God is, is the opposite of sin. Sin brings death and God is life. And God said, no, it's time to live again. The final barrier that was removed for death and actually, before I get to that, I just want to point this out. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 says this, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. You know, I hate death. I really do. Death takes away every single precious thing that I have in my life. Oh, I've got things that I, I like, and I, I have a Ricky Henderson signed baseball. Only Ricky Henderson and my aunt have ever touched that ball. My mom hasn't touched that ball. My dad hasn't touched that ball. But that ball is nothing compared to the life of my wife and my mother and my father. I hate death. And Jesus did already defeat sin, but the last enemy to be destroyed will be death, and it will be cast into the lake of fire. It's going to lose. No matter how many victims it claims now, when Jesus rose from the dead, he demonstrated his power over it, and it knows its clock's ticking, and its end is coming. So we see that there was a command to remove a barrier between Lazarus and his Lord, between Lazarus and his life, and finally between Lazarus and his loved ones. Verse 44, and he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, who? His family and the people around him, loose him and let him go. Right now for my dad, he's not with us. I thought it was actually very appropriate when my mom called me up and through her sobs, I heard the words, he's gone. Not he is dead, he's gone. He isn't here, he's there. And one day we understand 
that Jesus is going to come again. And he is going to wipe out all of the sin and the pain in this world and destroy death. And we will be reunited with my father. With every single person that anyone in here may have lost, if they were a believer in Jesus Christ, we will be reunited with them in perfect bodies. Without the sin, without the suffering, without the pain. My dad will be able to eat as many Oreos, chocolate chip cookies, and Coca-Colas as he wants without any cholesterol gumming up the veins. Because he'll have a perfect body. And we will too. The message of that's really simple. Don't miss the reunion. Don't miss it because it's your choice. God will not now, nor has he ever forced anyone to follow him. Well, that's, that's Satan's mode. Satan's the one that lets you uh, think that you're doing your own thing and then he drags you down the road and makes you do what he wants you to do. Jesus calls patiently and persistently, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. All that the Father giveth to me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. close with this. For many of you, you know this, some of you may not. There was a man whose name was Horatio, Horatio Gates Spafford. Horatio was a business owner in Chicago. He also believed in Jesus Christ and he and his family were very faithful. And when this great Chicago fire hit the town, it wiped out much of his belongings and a lot of his wealth. And he was so distraught that a family doctor said, I think what you need is to take a sea voyage and just get away and go. They agreed it was a good idea, but Horatio could not go right at that moment. He had to finish tying up some business news. And so he sent his wife and his kids on before him and said, I'll join you uh, in England in a few days. While his wife and kids were out on this ship, a storm came and sunk the ship. All of his children died, and the only one who survived was his wife. When she reached the other side of the Atlantic, she sent a telegram back with only two words on it, saved alone. Horatio boarded that ship and sailed the same path. And when they got over the place where the other ship had sunk, the crew had kind of talked about, should we tell him that this is where his children died? And they decided it would be wrong not to, so they told him. He went over to the side of the ship and he looked down at the icy waters of the North Atlantic. And he began to write these words, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. How could you possibly still believe in God when he allows such sin and pain and suffering in our lives, when he allows death to come, well, it's well with my soul because this is not it. This is not it. I will see my father again someday. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will too. If you don't, I know that there's nothing my dad would rather have accomplished by his life that you would trust Christ as your Savior today. It's a free gift. God doesn't make you pay for it. You couldn't pay for it if you tried. And if you will just understand that he came to die to save us from sin. Jesus didn't come because he's a mean God. He came on a rescue mission. Will you accept the saving gift of salvation? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In a moment, I'm going to pray, and then we will be dismissed. There are two tables at the back, which ask, which advertise that if you want to know about how to have a relationship with God, that they'll tell you. If you don't know for sure that you're going to see my dad again one day, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I'd encourage you to approach those tables and someone will take the Bible and show you how you too can trust Jesus Christ as your Savior so that you too will have that assurance so that you can say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Let's bow in prayer. Father, I thank you so much for the life that you gave to my father. 
I thank you for the way that he impacted every single one of us. And I thank you that he's safe with you now. That that Parkinson's can't bother him anymore. That no strokes will anymore afflict him. And that as that last verse said, that in a nobler, sweeter song, he sings your power to save. Father, if there is anyone in this room who doesn't know you as Savior, I pray that today would be the day that they would do so. So that they could join you and my dad at the reunion. And for those of us who are, thank you for allowing us to weep and for giving us the invitation that we've accepted to see him again. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. What a wonderful blessing it is to have the hope that we will be able to be in the heaven of Christ for all the time that we should mercy and all this. Well, two quick announcements before we dismiss. First of all, the family has invited us to the reception.